Nice. It's a bit too much light. It works. Or? Can you uh, dial it so that it's a little darker, the image overall on the screen? Alma. Yeah, it's going to make the image darker. In this case. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we're jumping into sort of an experimental form of presentation here. As you can see, this overhead projection. Uh, I'm here with Carlos Amorales, visiting us from Mexico City. Um, and so uh, just setting the stage here. <laughs> I think it's better. Yes, better, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this project so is about the self-portrait mask, which has a long history with Carlos. And our conversation started last summer when you posted a series of nine masks on Instagram with the caption, text-to-image, self-portrait mask. I immediately started to wonder who was the self mm -hmm. in this portrait. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a philosophical riddle. One further complicated by knowing your past work with self-portrait masks and experiments displacing and mirroring your identity. I wondered if some of the data mixed into the synthetic AI representations might even include images of your own work that are floating around online. Where did your interest in masks begin? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I mean, last year I all started by playing with the, I read in the newspaper about this new program that translated. Can you hear? <coughs> Maybe uh, we need You're to turn you me? up a little bit. Okay. Can you turn up uh, Carlos a teeny bit? Hello? Yes? It's okay? Yeah, I think it's maybe just like there. Okay. Uh, so last year I, I was reading in the newspaper about this program that translated words to images and I became curious. Uh, one of the first things I thought to play with was to perhaps try to do, you know, to write some of my older work or like some old ideas or, or things I did like long ago. And one was to make this self-portrait as a mask, which was a piece I did in 96 uh, when I was still studying at the Rijks Academy, which I think I can consider my first artwork. Uh, yeah, I can show some images, I mean, this mask, I went, to a, <clears throat> I went to a mask maker in Mexico and I asked him to just directly um, make a portrait of myself. Sorry, it's a bit a mess here, but anyway. But he came up with this mask that it was supposed to be me or represented me, <clears throat> which I, I, I decided to call a Morales. Uh, here is a bit part of the process. And I used this mask for seven years. I was working with it like for quite long um, until <clears throat> it became a project that gradually uh, grew and grew and grew. Uh, until, yeah, <clears throat> I eventually presented in the Pompidou Museum. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> So this is in 2001? Uh, in 2000. 2000, okay. 2000, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think what, what, what I thought was interesting was to ask uh, this machine uh, to make a self-portrait. Uh, what it became uncanny to me was that I made this, came out with these images <clears throat> and looked pretty close to what was done uh, about like 25 years ago, you know, there was this sort of very simplistic feature. Something was very right. synthesized. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was kind of, yeah, like surprised, like how it came to, to this. And so in 2019, to jump forward in time, mm -hmm. um, for an exhibition at the Stiedlich, you wrote The Factory and Manifesto. In the text, you talk about different ways to think about the mask, approaching different metaphors and different symbolic uses. 
One of them is the mask stands in between like a membrane. It hides the self from the gaze of the other. The mask is not only a representational image, but a tool to perform in a given time and space, which is defined as the meeting of two realms of existence, the real and the virtual. So this kind of project that we're looking at right here on my screen, can we talk about the transition from the AI into the sort of space of the virtual mask or that maybe mm -hmm. early days you'd be thinking more about an avatar? Mm -hmm. I mean, the text is called The Rhetoric of the Mask, and it's really a, like a reflection of what mask can be. Uh, yeah. That, you know, after working with, for so long with it. And uh, yeah, I think my interest then was to find this, this way or, or to access fantasy, like to, to, be, to be able to, to be, in, you know, to, to be jumping from reality, let's say, into fantasy. And uh, what I found was that in Mexico, for instance, with the wrestling tradition, they, they had like a very simple way to do it which was by using the mask. Like wrestlers in Mexico, they perform in films, you know, like superheroes, but mm -hmm. in the other hand, they also perform like in reality, like you can go and see them on Saturdays, for instance, wrestle with the mask. Or like El Santo was one example. For instance, like El Santo. So mm -hmm. we had this kind of story there where there's a reality and fiction were kind of jumping easily. Uh, and these characters were able to do it. So I thought it was very interesting to have like a, like a tool or like an artifact that you could just put yourself and immediately be in that other space. And eventually with, with the internet and how it all developed, I thought, well, this, is, this could be like an interesting tool to, to reflect on that or to... <clears throat> And what I did was to, to basically do one mask and start trying it and one of, you know, like playing with it. And one of the things I did was to turn it as a, as a sock, you know, like turn it inside out or, you know, like turn it and like, for instance, how you turn a glove. And, <clears throat> and then I realized that, that you could have this kind of game of having the inside outside or the outside inside, like something very simple like that. And I made these pictures of myself wrestling against myself, but with, let's say, the inside out suit against the normal suit or like simple things. And yeah, then I started to realize that, well, that the, the mask in itself is like a, like a cloth. It's like, it's, it's really a membrane. It's something really, really in between let's say, two things, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's also this aspect of the mass that speaks more to the role, to its role in ritual as a tool used in different cultures to more social transformation, to mark a moment in, uh, of rupture or expressive freedom. Can the mask be a tool for social transformation or transformations of the self? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one important thing that we had in Mexico right here. <coughs> it's called Super Barrio, uh, who was, I mean, we had a big earthquake in 85. And because of the earthquake, there were many dead people, but also there were many people uh, who lost their houses. So all these people became slowly, uh, yeah, like a super big movement, mm -hmm. uh, which was heralded or, or spearheaded by this character called Super Barrio. Yeah. And Super Barrio was one of the first left-wing strategies to enter the media. Like, it was really one of the first ways to, to appeal, you know? Like, they made this very media-friendly character. It was very funny. It was based on El Santo, this famous wrestler. But he was like a fat uh, wrestler dressed in yellow with red. So he was very, very eye-catching. And what he did was just to walk in front of the of the of the demonstration and be kind of really like opening, like, like you know, basically going between the policemen. <clears throat> and they developed a very interesting slogan, which was, uh, we're all super barrio. So like basically saying we are all uh, behind, we can be all behind the mask. So like whoever you think you're catching, it can be somebody else behind. No? 
And that created like a big impunity, let's say, or a big mm. freedom for, mm -hmm. for the movement. Right. Uh, that comes later in the 90s with uh, the Zapatista movement, right. uh, which they also were, were this back, well, we I mean, are, not properly masked, but uh, right. yeah, so everybody can be Marcos. So they take over the slogan. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's a very interesting, which is what? What is the power of anonymity? No, like what? Let's say once you hide, or, or yeah, you would say hide behind a mask. <clears throat> what can you do? What are you allowed to do? No, and especially politically. So let's see. Yeah, let's talk about the politics. So masks are uncanny. You wrote because they make us wonder who the wearer is. The person wearing the mask gains special powers. The power of distance, the power of anonymity, and the power of becoming a fictional character. These three powers combined become the power of the mask. Therefore, the person who wears a mask has power. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of thinking about the various transformations that are possible in the space of the mask. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what interests me most there is uh, the idea of distance, no? mm -hmm. like the idea of, of <clears throat> of being able to to put yourself outside of the situation and kind of be able to analyze the situation. Mm -hmm. So it's like this idea of looking at yourself from above, mm -hmm. uh, which, yeah, I think is, is, you know, it's like the kind of things that, that make a mask. Uh, I mean, I was really interested in this idea of the mask that's not really a mask, the public persona question that we talked about yesterday. So. You wrote, the public persona of a pop star or a politician is a mask mm. of branding. It's the face that appears in the media, which hides its face behind the mask. Public personas are masks that become multiplied by the media. So this is sort of like an invisible mask, or the idea of someone's face that becomes almost like a yeah. symbol. It's like, <clears throat> like, let's say, your public persona, no? So it's, it's uh, let's say you have the factual mask, the, the real mask, you know, like a wrestling mask or like a ritual mask. But <clears throat> somebody who becomes public, you know, like it, it can also work in, in in creating a sort of idea of its uh, of himself or herself that as a mask, no? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that happens a lot. And I think that's also that so that happens a lot with the internet, that we start to create an image of ourselves, that we start to curate, you know, like we start to to re you know to direct the way we are perceived. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens uh, quite commonly. So that becomes also like a mask. You don't have to be like metaphorically wearing a mask, like for instance. Yeah. Uh, here. <laughs> so this is but one of like 200 masks you made. Yeah. To, you know, yeah. and this, this is another one here we can look at that are now available on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which we're sort of just experimenting with, right? Mm -hmm. We're sort of like, let's make a couple of these and see how they work and how they function in this sort of digital space, mm -hmm. you know. Which, for instance, we will be projected somewhere else. Like, people will be seeing us like that. It will be a completely different experience as seeing who we are. Because it allows anonymity, even if there's ruptures in the space of the virtual AR mask. Yeah. We can... I mean, it allows this distance, no? It right. allows this... this yeah. So at one point, you were thinking about the mask as interface. You wrote, the word interface is meant in the sense of a user interface, which refers to a device that enables interaction between people and computers by means of, a graphic, by means of graphic metaphors that represent common objects or places in order to activate digital functions easily, mm -hmm. like a kind of mask. Yeah, I mean, was this idea to think the mask more as a symbol? To as, as the connector no, of, of these two realms. No? Like, as I said, it uh, can be the inside and the outside, no? or, or it can be a fantasy versus reality, or, or you know, like, <clears throat> like this, this space, no? like, uh, like you and me, uh, uh, countries, no? cultures, like this. So I, I thought the mask could be this, this this gate, no, that, that could connect to, of course, in a symbolical way. Right. We also talked the other day about 
the protective nature of a mask mm -hmm. for people who are shy mm -hmm. or who are, and I think we all experienced some version of this during COVID, you know, the kind of hiding behind the face mask. I mean, it, it may be, at least in my lifetime, our lifetime, um, you know, more experience wearing masks than ever before and kind of getting a feel for what that really means, mm -hmm. you know, to sort of hide behind it a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this sense that we're entering um, also the kind of political landscape where people might want to have masks because of surveillance, recognition of faces and this kind of thing. So mm -hmm. what it, how do we think about the mask today in relation to all these kind of various forms of the mask that we've experienced recently? Mm. How has it changed over the 20 years you've been I thinking about it? The mask <coughs> can be thought as something that allows for... I mean, it's difficult to say because with the recent experience we had with COVID, yeah. uh, which, I mean, they are masked, but not properly masked. They are face masks, they are just half masks. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there was a very clear uh, sanitary reason why we're wearing it, so right. it's not symbolical. Sure. Uh, but on the other hand, it allows to to experience them for a quite a long time. So it, it, it became normalized. You know, like, I don't know for you, but like you got used to wear it every time you go outside and you, like I remember seeing people for one year and not, not like meeting new people and not seeing their faces, you know, like, and kind of taking that for normal. Um, but I feel that, that the mask can allow a certain privacy, you know, a mask, uh, like it's sort of, a certain obscurity, you know, a certain possibility of not being surveilled or not being seen or not being always in the same the public. Mm -hmm. And it can be the, the actual public, but also like the, the mediatic public. So I feel a mask is also like, like, a, like a resting place, you know, like it can be a, a place to, to be yourself, to rest, to, to feel free. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I have the feeling that masks are, are, can become more and more important. Uh, could, could we talk about you taking the name Amaralis and that moment of sort of taking on a, a role or a, not, maybe not an avatar, but of a kind of other identity, you know, where the mask mm -hmm. sort of plays a role in this new formation of identity and how that emerged for you? Well, Amaralis is... is well, the thing is, I'm the son of an artist, so and we, we have the same name. <laughs> so, right, right. So for me, when I was uh, young, I, I, I had the chance or either to take my father's name and take it on and become something like Junior, mm -hmm. <laughs> or like Little Carlos, mm -hmm. or change my name. And then I was playing with, with my, in Mexico, we use two surnames. And I had the Aguirre from my father and the Morales from my mother. And I just took the A and I put it together and it became like amoral. Amoral. I was like, wow, that's nice, right. like, that's interesting. So it's not immoral, but amoral. Amoral, so. like without moral. Like right. it's not amoral, not uh, immoral or moral. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I thought, okay, well, that, what can that be? Yeah. And of course, in that time, you had people like, you know, you have famous people like Sid Vicious or Johnny Rotten. So I thought, well, Carlos Amorales can <laughs> enter into this kind of punk kind of, uh, like mentality, uh, <clears throat> and it became a very fundamental change. It became really the, perhaps my biggest gesture as, as an artist, because mm -hmm. since then, since that moment when I changed my name, I became an artist. Mm -hmm. And I used to paint, and suddenly I was doing something completely else. I, I started to work with this mask, I started to do performance, I started to mix, mix the mask in my own life, and mixed with my private uh, photography and, and, and my exhibitions, you know, so I, so I started to completely do something different. Uh, until one day, a uh, Dutch um, kind of experience gallerist told me like, you know, there is this film called Onibaba, which is about somebody who wears a mask, but in a point, she cannot take it away anymore. Oof. And I was like, fuck, what does he mean? You know, like, what, what is this about? And I started to think about it, and I started to see. And then, you know, as I said, I worked seven years with this project. I started to realize what's becoming more and more hard mm. to take the mask. Mm. And not, of course, literally, but, for instance, as an artist, how to stop making... Uh, 
works with masks, no? like how to, <clears throat> to keep doing the same sort of performance. Like I, I did it here in Pompidou, then I did it in Tate, and then SF MoMA, and the, you know, so it was very well accepted, but I thought, okay, I cannot go forever doing this. You know, it, I'm also changing, uh, I'm not interested anymore, uh, I want to do other things. <clears throat> But the mask was heavy, you know, and people were wanting the mask. Mm. So yeah, I finally found a way to take it away. <laughs> <laughs> or share it Until with other people. Until now, huh? yeah. <laughs> so that it's back here. We mentioned earlier that there's like 200 of these masks that you made with AI. I mean, we can look at a couple of the other ones. Um, and these are just a few. Yeah, these are just a few of the 200. Can, can we imagine a space of we are all Amaralis, you know, where people are using these masks in different ways out of your nightmare. control? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want yeah. But I like to play with the idea of, of, of the slogan of Super Barrio. Mm. Uh, I, will act, I mean, there, there are very interesting movements in the 2000s, for instance, uh, Anonymous is one, or right. there is Luther B. said before, where, for instance, with Luther B said that it's not even an image, it's just uh, it's a name. Mm. So it's the name that conveys this kind of identity that people hide behind. Uh, in Anonymous, they use uh, the, this mask from the comic. Uh, they would love to do something with that. Well, let's see. So where, where do we find these on, on the internet right now? It's, it says self-portrait mask is the the link is the or the account. I think so. And yeah. People can use them themselves right now. Sure. These two anyway. Yeah. Okay. It's not a lot. <laughs> it's not a lot. Start. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a lot. More to come. Well, thank you so much for taking the no, time to chat. No, thank you for yeah. your questions. Yes. Hey, so um, unfortunately, uh, quick update, Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst uh, were meant to come, and then uh, Matt was going to come because they just had a baby a few months ago, and then Matt got COVID, so, <laughs> which I didn't know, still floating around, but um, so he's going to join us via Zoom in just a minute, so just kind of getting the connection sorted out. Is he there? Yeah. Mm. Okay. You can turn my mic off if you want. We leave all the papers on the table and we go with this. We can take it off. Can you turn my mic off, please?
throttle mic. Can I talk to him with this? Can I talk to him? I can hear you. Matt, are you there? I am. Hi. Okay. How are you? We don't have a video yet. Oh, yeah, that's because I haven't turned it on. Okay. There you are. Hey. Oh, wow, you, you can see me, like, <clears throat> I don't know exactly where that camera is, but. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. I know you're still sick, and um, this is an important moment because we're, this is a world premiere of your new film, so really we wanted you to be here, but. Um, I, I really regret not, not being there, and the latest news is Holly that has COVID, so. We're oh, both. man. <laughs> Never ending. Yeah. So sorry. It's never ending. It's, it, you know, it's it's totally fine. Uh, uh, but yeah, it is a it is a great shame to not to not be there. Um, uh, well, it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> well, the connection is incredibly good. So we're gonna see and hear everything really beautifully. The sound is very crisp. So we'll let you jump in uh, to your presentation on AI and consent. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I will try and keep it. Uh, somewhat brief, but I've got a lot to share on this. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Wait one second. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yeah, we see you. Oh. Great. Perfect. OK, yeah. Um, uh, it's peculiar not being able to see uh, who's in the room. Uh, I have this uh, stunning image of a table in front of uh, three pictures. Um, so yeah, forg forgive me if at times I sound like I'm talking to myself. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought in, in advance of, of the screening, um, so some of this uh, uh, relates uh, uh, to the work that's going to be shown. Um, and some of it is just kind of maybe expanding on the world um, that we've been uh, attempting to build or influence. Um, yeah, the, the, the scope of the talk today I called it consent protocols. I probably should have called it that in the program. Um, uh, but you know, I think within the, 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 the curatorial framing of understanding that this is kind of a, uh, a new-ish moment um, uh, in, in media and art and expression, um, the, the one area that we've been thinking about uh, quite a lot for, for quite a few years is this, this idea of consent and, um, and protocols for both creating new works um, and interacting with works in, in ways that are perhaps uh, uh, consequential. Um, oh, there you are. I can see everyone now. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, to, to, to frame this a little bit, um, you know, the, the question of intellectual property and consent in the AI era is uh, uh, delicious um, uh, uh, for a few reasons, right? Like the, the idea of kind of IP protectionism, um, you know, the, the, these 20th century, going back even uh, longer, uh, ideas of, of copyright and so on are really being kind of stretched, um, uh, and uh, and are to some extent kind of untenable in this new paradigm, in, in a paradigm in which you know a machine or something connected to a machine only needs to witness a, an artwork or a voice. Um, and can then uh, create it or recreate or spawn works from it infinitely. Um, older ways of thinking about this are kind of untenable. Um, and I would also argue that unconditional freedom of information, the, these kind of very romantic utopian ideas, uh, many will be familiar with uh, from you know, the beginning of the internet or the, the, the sampling wars and so on. I, I would also argue are, are kind of untenable. Um, uh, reason being, and we're kind of seeing this a little bit with uh, the training of large models, right? It's like um, the the idea that uh, just having works available for free uh, to everyone at all times, uh, you know, without kind of any adequate credit compensation uh, mechanisms in place, that only seems to benefit those with the most compute. Um, and so I'd argue in a sense, this is kind of a uniquely 21st century conundrum. Um, you know, and an invitation for for new protocols, or with with potentially quite vast implications for what we create, how we create, uh, how we get paid, what institutions are, are birthed, so on and so forth. Um, so, um, 
I've personally been thinking about this issue for quite some time. So the best part of a decade ago, I started um, working on a protocol I called Saga at the time. This was a, a decentralized publishing framework that would allow for artists to set um, discrete permissions on every version of their work that appeared on the internet. So um, the best way to describe this is unlike, let's say, if you, uh, you know, posted a video to YouTube and that video was then embedded in a hundred different locations, um, you only really had like an offer on switch uh, with that media, right? You could choose to take the video down from YouTube and it would be taken down everywhere. Um, what Saga did was slightly different and I would argue was kind of um, the idea uh, is echoed a little bit in, in what ended up happening in the crypto space is it, it, every single time um, a work was uh, uh, posted um, or reposted or embedded somewhere, um, uh, you would be able to access that work as if it was unique um, and set your own permissions on how it would be interacted with. You could change the work in one particular location, so on and so forth. Um, so long story short, it's something I've been personally obsessed with for, for quite some time to the point of mania. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, jogging forward a, a few years later, Holly and I, um, when we first started working with uh, uh, machine learning models, um, this is a, an image on the far left of Spawn and like the first uh, basic uh, computer we put together to be able to train our own models. Um, it's kind of a funny thing, right? The, the, the first question that you have to ask yourself when you begin to train a machine learning model is, uh, what data do you use? It's like step A, right? Um, and uh, yeah, at, at the time we were really interested in, in thinking about, you know, can we train a model to sing? Can we collaborate with the model in order to produce uh, 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 pieces of music? And, and when first invited to, uh, to um, uh, collect data or you know, or choose, or when we're first invited to choose what data we want to use to put into those models, uh, we're like, ah, this is going to be a really big deal. Um, uh, cause of course we could either choose to train it on ourselves, um, or the Beatles or whatever. Right. And it, it just became really, really clear that this is going to become a matter of, of, of extreme consequence in no time. Um, what we did do, uh, uh, over the course of, 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 let's say the three years that we ran this project, was we chose to put together a protocol of, of uh, conduct, let's say, um, where we would only train models on either ourselves or consenting people uh, in our community or in our audience. Um, so I'll play a little clip here because it's more fun if I play media. Um, this was one of the early attempts of, of producing kind of a, a singing, a, singing uh, a, 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 a model using only uh, consenting data. Um, one of the other experiments we, we did around this time was um, large kind of consensual uh, training ceremonies. Um, so we would gather people together either at concerts or in explicit art performances um, uh, and inform them that uh, in, in kind of core and response singing exercises that we were doing, people were, uh, were hopefully consenting to uh, uh, training a large model uh, with us. Um, uh, a lot of people, I, I don't know if they quite knew uh, what we were up to at the time. I hope in retrospect, it seems a little more, um, a little more legible. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, these performances were, were, were quite successful. Uh, uh, people uh, uh, participated full-throatedly. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example here. And so uh, over time with this approach, I think we ended up collecting, it's somewhere between, between the realms of, of 50 to 100,000 um, consenting singing voices. Um, we recently actually wrapped this into a model that we're hoping to be able to sing through. I can kind of play you a, an example of how the model sounds right now. This is, this is not prompted by a voice, but just kind of left to uh, unconditionally, unconditionally generate them. Um, but, it, but it sounds really great. Right? Um, 
well, I think what's kind of interesting about these uh, collective uh, training experiments, we'll touch on this a little bit more later, but they really they really expose a couple of things, right? One that um, a lot of the models that we interact with now, due to the uh, the kind of vast uh, uh, data requirements, are ostensibly you know uh, collective accomplishments, right? Like whether you um, whether you uh, look in the kind of language model space where you know, these are uh, large models that are trained on the sum total of documented uh, 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 human expression uh, scraped rather wantonly um, uh, from the web or let's say image models that, that we'll get to a, a little bit later. Um, and so uh, we, we found it actually personally quite beautiful to uh, to address that head on and just say, okay, well, what if, you know, what if we could e explicitly um, invite people into to train these models um, uh, collectively um, and then hopefully end up uh, sharing the proceeds, which is which is the plan uh, with that singing model. We're going to be uh, wrapping it in in something people can use um, and sharing it with them. Um, another uh, experiment that's maybe worth uh, touching on is in 2021, we did a series of clip portraits uh, we call classified. Um, uh, uh, for, for those who maybe don't know, CLIP is a popular um, text image pair model. It's a guidance model. Uh, in, in short, basically, when you use like a DALI or a mid-journey or something like that, most of these text -to image models, um, what you're actually interacting with is two models. There's a model that understands what you're typing. Um, uh, and that model then takes you on kind of a walk through uh, 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 you know, walk through to uh, to to instruct uh, instruct the generator on what to actually generate, um, and it turns out that the uh, the clip um, uh, trained on the open web um, knew who Holly uh, was, right? So she met a certain threshold of notoriety to be able to be picked up by clip, so that you can actually uh, prompt her name uh, in much the same way that you can prompt Salvador Dali or whatever when you're trying to uh, uh, reference a style in in an image generator. Um, and so, uh, obviously, this was done in a in a non consenting uh, non consenting manner, but is worth noting that uh, that this is now something uh, available uh, to everybody. And so, we we did a series of of self portraits, trying trying to remain as uh, uh, as closely aligned to the to this idea as possible to actually show you what um, what clip infers Holly to uh, uh, to be. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on some things later that. That maybe qualify why we think this is this is interesting um, that you know someone's embedding, which is the the term you would use, like the concept of somebody that may exist in a public model is kind of a site of uh, contention or or something to uh, uh, to play with and manipulate. Um, uh, I'll touch on that uh, a little bit more uh, a little bit more later. Um, I guess the other the other uh, 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 project to uh, to reference that that we started around about the same time was something called Holly Plus. Um, uh, long story short, it's it's a protocol for uh, for the governance of an AI voice um, or a, a kind of digital twin, um, and so you can go to Holly dot plus, um, uh, upload uh, any audio, for example, and uh, it will return back to you um, uh, that same audio uh, uh, in Holly's Holly's voice. Um, we since developed it, and uh, um, it's also available as a um, as a, a piece of software where you can sing through her voice in real time. Let me demonstrate that here. And with this microphone, you'll hear a live version of Holly Plus developed with Vokter Labs. <laughs> so the, the, on, on this topic of kind of uh, consent protocols, um, in essence, what, what we actually felt the art piece was in this is kind of the the, the governance mechanism itself, right? Um, and so, what, what we what we put in place was this idea that anybody would be free, for example, to um, to use the model freely. Um, you know, you can make what you want with it. Um, however, if you did want to actually sell something uh, commercially, um, you, there is a mechanism for you to. Um, submit works for approval by Holly and a group of people who actually govern the voice. Um, and if a sale actually takes place, um, the, the person who's uh, using the voice would receive 50% of the proceeds. 40% um, of those proceeds would go back into this group that governs the voice. Let's say just keep it going to fund new instruments to encourage more people to make more work with the voice. Um, and 10% of it will go back to Holly herself for, for donating the IP. Um, we, we feel that that kind of uh, 
protocol for 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 governing of a voice is is, is quite elegant and um and you know in the past year for example we've seen quite a few people uh, uh, come to similar conclusions about how um about how this this ought to work out um in fact i saw it was debated in congress um yesterday um yeah so i mean all, all this is a bit of a presage to uh, some of the the parallel work we've been doing we we, we started an organization uh, spawning with um, uh, Jordan Meyer, Patrick Hobna. Um, spawning is a term that we came up with. Um, speaking earlier of the need for new protocols, uh, uh, spawning is new vernacular, um, right? So we, we're trying not to um, confuse this delicious new problem with, let's say, sampling or collage or these kind of older concepts that are maybe a bit too overburdened with, uh, with, with, with meaning and, and uh, inference. Um, uh, and spawning is a term that we use simply for um, the ability to generate infinite new media um, from a training set of old media, right? So that can be a training set of somebody's uh, voice, art style, uh, whatever it might mean. Um, and, and when put like that, it's really quite clear we do actually need new terms for these things, right? Because, um, uh, you know, it, it's quite, it's quite self-evident that it is a different, it's very different to, let's say, um, sample David Bowie's voice and place it in a new context, uh, right? Uh, pitch it up, pitch it down, slow it down, whatever. Um, that's quite a different proposition than the ability to, let's say, train a model on uh, 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 you know, data from David Bowie's voice um, and then be able to sing any number of you know, uh, uh, new songs uh, 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 assuming that identity, right? It's, it's very, very qualitatively and consequentially different different thing uh, ergo it probably needs a new term um and so yeah the, the so the mission with spawning really was to, to experiment with you know can we build like let's say a consent layer for um uh, the ai fueled internet what, like what would that look like um and so the the, the first uh, project we put together is a website called have i been trained uh, have i been trained .com, um, where you're able to uh search through with blazingly fast caption search i might add um uh, uh, popular uh, image data sets that are used to train these text to image models. Um, and I guess what's kind of interesting uh, on top of this is that once we kind of give people the ability to see what's inside these models, um, we, we've also developed a, a what we're trying to implement as a standard right now, um, the ability for people to say whether or not they want their work to be included in models trained going forward. Um, so this little animation will show you um, the opt-out procedure, right? It's really simple. You just uh, right-click, add to my opt-outs, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, as, as things stand, I mean, this has been going for just over six months. Um, we're actually up to 1.4 billion opted out pieces of media. Um, we think that number is going to grow significantly. I also think it's fairly significant. In, in the entire life cycle of Creative Commons, I believe uh, those licenses were attached to 2.2 billion pieces of media. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, the potential to build very expressive um, AI <clears throat> Uh, 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 IP standards in this in this kind of domain is is really untapped and and you know there's there's a, there's a lot there. Um, and what we do is we take those uh, opt out requests um, and send them with an API um, to AI model trainers. Uh, there's a small Python package that we built that um, allows for you know without really interfering or kind of messing up the training process, allows for people to check. Um, if a piece of data uh, has been opted out by its creator um, at training time, it's, it's um, very simple. And part of the reason we feel this is important, even beyond the, the, the kind of sticky question of uh, whether to, to afford people consent in this context, is that we really feel that uh, your embedding, so when I was talking earlier about Holly and the clip portraits, right, like your presence inside a public model, um, it may seem abstract at this particular point in time, but I think that uh, over time, it will become quite clear that your embedding in public models is a new kind of social identity, and, and that will grow in, in significance, right? Um, uh, th this isn't maybe uh, new per se, right? Like, I think most people are familiar with the fact that there's some companies somewhere that have a social profile of you that you have no access to, um, that they can reference, right? Maybe they know, you know, where your parents live and what school you went to and how much debt you ever got in or whatever. Um, but but uh, I think that over time, as we start seeing um, 
uh, these AI models uh, uh, grow in, in prominence um, uh, and, and become, you know, uh, uh, more significant interfaces to uh, to the world or, or to information, people are going to want to have more discrete control over uh, who they are in that world. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, some consistency between who they are in DALI and who they are in GPT and who they are in the 100,000 other models that, that we're likely going to interact with in the next, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, and so I think uh, on this topic of uh, of, of consent, uh, there's a few. These are this is now getting more into the kind of uh, provocation uh, realm. <clears throat> um, our argument, at least, is that once we get past this kind of uh, 20th century uh, uh, mindset regarding IP, worrying, you know, trying to relate these things back to sample wars and DMCA takedowns and Napster and so on and so forth, um, once we kind of like get ourselves out of that depression um uh, uh, there's actually a great i think a, a great reason to be very optimistic uh here um uh, you know i think that ai native ip standards may offer uh deeper consent than previously possible for artists um you know the ai field internet is driven by natural language um for those who that doesn't make any sense right it, it's uh, everything is prompted you, you know uh, a machine, a machine is able to uh, parse and and, and understand uh, work, uh, 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 understand you in the language that you speak, um, and as such, we feel that consent will be and can be very expressive uh, moving forward, um, uh, and uh, expressive both. You know, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, yeah, so, so here, here's a here's an example. Um, right, I'm I'm happy for this work to be used in non-commercial settings. If you would like to use it commercially, please ask surrogate 41252. Um, send 10% of funds generated in my image um, to the Ocean Conservation Trust. Please don't spoil me in a pornographic context. I prefer to be photographed from my left side. I prefer not to be pictured next to political figures. My voice is not available for podcasts and only spawn me from ages 25 to 40. Um, right, if you imagine, uh, uh, you know, Creative Commons actually did some incredible work back in the, the days of blogs and Flickr to give you a bit more discrete uh, control over, you know, what, you know, trying to make basically web native permissions. Uh, my argument, at least in this case, is that natural language permissions are kind of boundless and, and super compelling and interesting uh, uh, for this reason. Um, yeah, and maybe on, on the more uh, uh, speculative side, um, we were talking recently, we were actually recently at a, at a uh, kind of gathering with Primavera de Filippi, um, and it's funny, we both kind of came to this term protocol art from very different directions, um, uh, and we may be co-authoring something uh, going forward if, if, if my sickness is not holding it up. Um, but we've been discussing this idea of protocol art for some time. I mean, you know, uh, I guess going back even to Saga like 10 years ago, my assertion at the time was, or, or just the observation was that, you know, the, the protocols and incentive models that, that determine how we use the internet have really tangible outcomes for art, right? Like um, if you're familiar with, you know, the musical space, it's quite clear that the ways in which uh, Spotify is designed uh, privilege some kinds of art over others. Um, and over time, you know, music and, and the things people enjoy and the things people get to interact with, uh, you could argue were determined by those protocols of interaction, um, very low level, often invisible, or, or often kind of like uh, un under scrutinized um, uh, 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 levels of interaction. And so as such, um, crafting a protocol is in itself an act of artistic consequence, because one could imagine uh, developing a new platform that incentivized other kinds of things and that having uh, uh, re a real world outcomes, real aesthetic, uh, interesting aesthetic uh, outcomes. And so I don't think that we've really grasped yet. I mean, a lot, there's a lot of hand waving around this point, but I don't think people have really fully grokked um, what it will mean to live in a world of near infinite media. Um, you know, uh, uh, this is something that's speculated on a little bit, right? People, uh, uh, but, but even now when you go, for example, onto like Google image search and you search for, you know, uh, an artist's name and then you see the flood of AI generated images, I feel like this is just, uh, you know, this is just a taste of what infinite media might mean, right? The, the absolute dilution of any one image or any one identity. Um, and so maybe a provocation that, that I'm, you know, interested in, Holly's very interested in too, um, is that in the near age of infinite media, um, you know, perhaps the protocols determining the navigation of a work or the navigation of an identity or a space will come to be considered works unto themselves. They're actually 
um, uh, going to be a crucial aspect of how one navigates the the world of an artist or 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 the world uh, uh, the world more broadly and that getting our hands dirty with the protocols that govern or 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 help us to navigate um, navigate the, the, the this world or or, the, or this media is 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 going to be taken more seriously as an artistic act um, uh, uh, and of course uh, you know, this is an area that, that we're spending uh, increasingly more time on and and it's a thesis that, that I find myself uh, uh, standing up to defend uh, uh, to defend uh, more and more um, yeah I mean I, I wish I could uh, I wish I could take more questions because I'm sure some people have pushed back about some of the things that, that were maybe said or maybe want some clarification. Um, I don't know if that if that is even uh, uh, possible, but but I guess uh, in in advance of the screening of the film, uh, I'd so regret uh, uh, not being there. The, 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 the film's called I'm Here, uh, 1712, 2022, um, It was actually made, um, it was made in January this year. Um, after a very profound uh, moment in Holly and uh, in my life, um, and I guess I guess without kind of trying to overload it or overburden it too much with um, uh, with words, um, I, th I think it, it's quite interesting as a, as an example of of you know conditionally sharing very private moments. Um, uh, uh, I, th I think when you when you see the film. Um, uh, a, a lot of that may may become clearer, but w one thing we were thinking about in making it is how you can use some of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, machine learning tools um, to be able to share uh, share very private things without giving away um, uh, uh, that private data itself. Um, and I, I I I wish I could elaborate more, and I, and and I'd, it would probably be more useful to be able to do so after after you've seen the film. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's actually it's actually a very meaningful work uh, uh, for the both of us, and uh, and I hope uh, I hope you you get something from it. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, um, as I say, I, I really regret I really regret uh, not being there, and and I hope that uh, uh, if you do have any any comments or, uh, or uh, uh, I'll be able to respond either either uh, today or 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 in future. Um, so yeah. Uh, Enjoy Thank you. Enjoy Thank you so much, Matt. <clears throat> so we're going to switch over to the film. We'll keep you on standby, Matt, for conversation, see how you're feeling. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, my name is Michael Connor. I'm co-director of Rhizome. I want to invite um, Juan and Carlos up to the stage to join me. We have a new table for this segment of discussion, just to mix things up, keep it lively. Um, but yeah, I'm, and I think Matt is still here with us on Zoom as well, which is, which is great. Thank you, for Matt, for sticking around. Um, hi. You guys can take the chairs if you want, and I'll stand off to the side. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, Matt, the last time um, Joseph and I, we organized a conference in New York a couple of years ago about blockchains and the future of institutions, and you dialed in on Zoom for that. Your reception is looking much better. Um, so things have really improved since then. And, but here we're talking about AI, which is very exciting. Um, but since, um, okay, there's a lot of things that are kind of bubbling up for me from these three videos and presentations. Um, and Matt, how are you feeling? Are you going to stick with us for a few minutes, or do we, should we um, dispatch you quickly? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to. I might just cough, but I can mute myself, so it's fine. Uh, oh, yeah, the, yeah, please. <laughs> please do what you need to do to take care of yourself, though, honestly. Um, if you disappear, anything's totally fine. Um, yeah, but uh, Juan, it's so great to meet you. We worked together years ago and have never met in person. And um, yeah, maybe um, I think that you know one of the threads that appeared for me in these three segments was um, sort of all around identity and the body and how these things are figured and rendered and presented in um, in archives and then appearing again in AI models and so forth. I suppose, I suppose the body and the voice um, and. 
Um, maybe I thought like we could also kind of go back to the prior session and use um, Rayon's concept of the unruly image, which I really liked, this idea that the image itself is unruly. Um, and that phrase really reminded me of um, some writing about um, early photography by Alan Sakula, um, an artist that's also written extensively on the history of photography. Um, and I was really thinking about this idea of like, early photography as a way of classifying people in the 19th century and how these kinds of depictions and classifications and composites were so important in the construction of society around this new technology of photography. And um, Sakula has this quote that I was thinking about, um, which is thinking about taming photography at this time, um, because photography was always sort of caught between, on the one hand, every image being totally specific and idiosyncratic, and on the other hand, images lending towards universal modes and moments. Um, so his quote is, um, you know, one way of taming photography was by means of this transformation of the circumstantial and idiosyncratic into the typical and emblematic. And I think that really stuck with me or was kind of in my mind as I was watching your work, Juan, that idea of the typical and emblematic. And like, why is it that this feels so dangerous to transform images into something so generic? And, um, you know, it's so interesting that Saku is coming from this position of like the disciplinary role of photography and your topic was protest. Um, was that like a specific connection you were drawing or can you, t um, like, what do you think, why does this, why is this imagery so sort of scary on some level? Um, for, but for many reasons, I think, because it's scary for, because of how close it is to us in the way that uh, organic social movements have been traditionally presented as the driving force of communality, like a moment, a, re, a, a moment in which bodies really interact with each other and with the and social and political and uh, structural interface of a city to promote change. But I arrived to it through uh, a distrust of that same reality. Um, and to make a long story short, I arrived to it through the phenomenon of astroturfing. And astroturfing is a phenomenon that's very, very much part of the United States political atmosphere right now. And it's that there's companies, and one of them is called Crowds on Demand, for example, that um, generate crowds for protests. And they are these, these are hundreds and sometimes thousands of actors that comprise protests in order to advance whatever political motive or commercial motive the client has for them. So in researching astroturfing, I started looking at images for pro of protests to see how generic they looked. And like, I think as an artist, you're always wondering, are, are the images making us or are we making the images? And, and, and in, in, in researching this particular set of, of data and, and images, for me, what was so intriguing and again, so terrifying in a way was to find that there were thousands of videos of protests that seemed completely uh, urgent at the time, uploaded almost instantly, like if it was almost generated by an AI system. So for me, it was kind of like the accelerated nature of this information kind of like looping back to us and kind of like putting me in a position in which I was, because of the very nature of this, this velocity, I was distrusting the, the same reality of how the image is constructed and how our reality was constructed. And I think that's where that threshold, I think that you mentioned with photography, like, like how it depicts, how it frames reality, how it depicts reality, and at the same time, how it distorts reality. Yeah, because I think that unruliness that Rayan mentioned is lost in these images completely, mm -hmm. which makes them fully different from a, an actual protest document and that is really unsettling and um, feels like a disciplinary action. But um, Carlos, in your work, the mask. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, well, yeah, feel free. Just answering the same. Uh, well, to me, they don't look that, un uh, how you say, uh, not universal, but you say the other word. Universal generic. generic. <clears throat> I think they look very American. Mm -hmm. 
So to me, it's like super particularly like the way the city looks, the way people look, the kind of people, what they're protesting about. So I wouldn't say it's generic, maybe it's generic for you, but I, w I wouldn't say it's universal. <clears throat> so that's one thing to say. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, how do you call it? Astro funding? Ast Astroturfing. <clears throat> it's okay. very interesting, big so because a it's, little it's, thing. It's a common it's practice <laughs> in many regimes, I mean, to buy people to go to your demonstration. I mean, they don't do it like, um, uh, how do you say, virtually, but they do it physically. physically. So, I mean, maybe you are seeing a lot of pictures that where actually half of the people are fake, mm -hmm. you know? So I think in that sense, it's not about a technical thing, but it's perhaps something that is a common practice since the 20th century or something, mm -hmm. I would it, say. In one little mm -hmm. uh, piece of information that is interesting, it's called astroturfing because astroturf is the name given to artificial grass in the United States because it's the name of the company that came up with that product. So it's used, the term astroturfing is used in opposition to grassroots activism. So you have grassroots activism that is real activism and then you have astroturfed activism, that it's the, the common practice of companies that are selling protests and crowds today. And you can find them publicly online. If you go to the internet and look for, look for crowds on demand, you can find these companies, which is kind of like an advanced kind of like version of what Carlos is talking, like crowds. I think in, in my country, in Colombia, politicians have been buying crowds, kind of like, we call it like under the table, you know, like just, just by paying them. But now in the United States, it's like an official business that is completely legitimate and normalized, as normalized as these images, you know? Yeah, so I think the process of taming, which is what's happening, it's like taming and forcing to conform to some image, which I use the word typical, but actually is not typical of any reality, and certainly even not in America. You know, that disciplinary process happens previous to the technology and within it. Would you say that's like a fair conclusion? Because in your work, I think the mask has a kind of, you know, the mask can be something that pushes us towards the generic, but in your work, I think the masks themselves are specific, but also the the universalizing aspect of it can be freeing as well? I think it had a, a <clears throat> ambiguous nature because <clears throat> it, was a, it was a mask of somebody's face. And normally masks are meant to be a fantasy face, you know, like the mask of a tiger or the mask of a Spider-Man or, you know, like, <clears throat> so when, you, when I asked uh, a mask of a real person, it kind of became immediately attached to an identity. But on the other hand, the way they did it was so basic that it looked very, uh, yeah, generic, I would say. <laughs> well, Which I mean, it's a quality, I would say. Right, and I don't, I mean, yeah. Well, it did, I wasn't saying that your and, mask and, looked that way necessarily. And I, but. And I think it, it connects to the way uh, images are made <clears throat> because there is this tendency to more and more realism. So, you know, the more you, you the, more, the better you make the effect is connected more to reality. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think that's one of the fears that we have today, that, that, you know, that deep, face can be, deep fakes can be done because they look so real, mm -hmm. you know, that we cannot distinguish anymore. And, and they start to work with these watermarks to, <clears throat> to distinguish an image that comes from uh, artificial intelligence and let's say a, yeah. a non one. Uh, <clears throat> but I think this is interesting that somehow the image has, starts to become, needs to become more sophisticated in order to become closer to reality. It needs to m move the unruliness it, it's back. It's like back supernaturalism, in. you know, like it's, right. I think something like that. Within AI generated images, uh -huh. it's, yeah. Uh -huh. But the mask has already this, the mask, that's why the mask is so basic. <laughs> <laughs> that it's already like occupying that similar space. It was made in the 90s, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, also in a context in which protest was happening. So exactly. we'll come back to that. But let's continue with masks for a moment because we should bring in Matt and the work made with Holly. Um, because I think there's a similar push and pull in, in the way that, um, yeah, I mean, your mask is also not generic, nor is yours, Matt and Holly. But, y you know, the seeing this room full of, well, just releasing it on the internet so that this identity can travel freely, um, it's kind of like in that work, you know, there's something sort of utopian about it. You give community ownership to an image, you free Holly from the burden of having to manage it entirely herself, 
it's kind of like an interesting position to occupy. And I, I kind of wanted to like, you know, bookmark that and actually talk about it in relation to how you use sort of small data sets. And I was curious if like that process of small data sets and controlled permissive data sets is actually allowing you to create more of a specific kind of imagery. Um, like if you see that in the results that you achieve. Um, like what are the aesthetics of working with these controlled data sets? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, I think, um, uh, uh, want to speak to the point before I think something that, that came to mind that, that, that I think is, is really re relevant here is, you know, when, um, when I was talking earlier about embeddings or these kind of concepts of, concepts of things or people that exist in these models, um, it's also, there's a really interesting tension there too where, you know, there's something uh, alarmingly, it, these things are treated as alarmingly objective when in fact they are trained on the commercial internet, right? So this kind of, the, the premise of truth is actually really shaky uh, uh, there, right? In the sense that, um, you know, with, with the clip portraits we did, for example, which, you know, in some ways do absolutely encap like, encapsulate some aspect of, of Holly, in, in actuality what's happening is, you know, these are trained on press releases and promotional photographs, right? These are, this is kind of a, a very rough aggregate interpretation of a person based on, on the commercial internet. And if, if we want for these images to become uh, any more uh, uh, sophisticated, you, you would hope to be able to push uh, uh, beyond the commercial or, or the superficial, right? Or the astroturfed, uh, 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 as you put it. Um, and, and that's one thing with, with, with the film that, that we found kind of interesting is that, you know, in, in fact, the, the, the footage that we were sharing there, all, all the footage was shot inside the hospital for like the most real moment of our lives. Um, it, it, was, it was masked in a way. Uh, actually, Holly hasn't seen some of that original footage because she can't bear to look at it. Um, but it was masked in, masked in such a way in which it could be shared um, and it felt like a really interesting counterpoint to what you would find on the open internet, right? Uh, it, it's like in order to, it, like, uh, it's about as real as it gets, uh, presented in this kind of masked way that, that at least obscures uh, uh, the most sensitive aspects of that. Um, uh, 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 to, to your point, Michael, um, about smaller curated data sets, it is true. I mean, I think that th there's two things going on, right? Like th the ability to fine tune um, uh, large models on smaller subsets of data to be able to produce a certain aesthetic outcome can be quite rich. Um, it, I would still argue to some extent it could be interpreted as somewhat superficial because uh, you're really talking about rendering a new style. I mean, if there is a possibility of a new style. When you're talking about faces, actually, you can get really uh, particular, right? Some of the face models that we trained for the video are very particular, um, particularly of the baby, for, for, for example, who has never had a picture taken of them before. So, um, but, uh, uh, but I think a, a critique there, which is actually something we're doing a lot of work on uh, uh, this year, is actually, you know, wondering if uh, breaking away from, let's say, using images as um, uh, the main kind of, uh, uh, the main point by which you would guide a model, right? Like focusing explicitly on style or on faces is actually a real limitation. And that in actuality, if you wanted to break beyond the superficial and start um, manipulating models and, and kind of using them in more expressive ways, you would actually start looking more at the fundamental concept, conceptual embeddings uh, in these models, you, you wouldn't be, for example, taking you know a hundred images and then uh, making something that looks a bit like you know a bit like your painting style or something like that. Rather, you would be saying, you know, can I share a model where, um, in my world, a dog is more closely associated with trauma than with a cat? You know, uh, th there is actually I think a lot of flexibility in, and, and there's a lot of kind of potential quote unquote realness. Uh, in, in diving in that deep and saying, actually, within a model, if I were to share it or invite someone else to navigate it, um, you can actually uh, uh, start, you know, uh, 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 saying that it's, it's maybe more meaningful uh, for you to understand the fundamental conceptual linkages, linkages that I would associate, rather than simply, uh, you know, a, a stylistic overlay that you know you could you could compare to like an Instagram filter or something like that, right? Um, uh, but, but, but to your point, like whether, whether it be working with more curated data sets, fine tuning, so on and so forth, or more like elaborate or kind of uh, uh, janky <laughs> approaches, uh, 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 your point is well taken. I think that you know, there's, there's going to come a point whereby um, it, it's, just, it, it's, a, it's a lot more gratifying to kind of 
get your fingers into these models and think about ways to manipulate them uh, toward a particular outcome. And I think that, that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, appreciation of that art or craft or whatever it is uh, uh, can, only, can only grow. Um, I, I hope that spoke to, spoke to the point, but, but, but that's, right. that's what came to mind. So what you're doing is not just using an existing model and tuning it. You are training the model from ground zero, essentially. Using or not not in the case of that film. The film so is using in, an existing tool because that would be like yeah yeah, 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 yeah okay yeah no, but in film, other cases the film, the film was using an existing tool to produce kind of a, a mask or or some kind of a filter yeah um, uh, with date I mean we 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 didn't uh, we did those were models that we fine tuned ourselves but the longer term project that we're working on from you know up until next year for for an exhibition is is a little bit more fundamental it's 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 about uh, uh, manipulating, it's about manipulating embedding, so it's so manipulating conceptual linkages between things versus an approach of, let's say, uh, uh, fine-tuning on style or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, getting, in, getting into the model is really interesting, and I think that always brings one back to training data and all, all of these other questions that arise in it. Um, but I think, like, you know, one of the obvious, like, dimensions of this, which I think your question pointed to is, um, you know, when we talk about like mask wearing and, you know, body measurement on the internet and the kind of phrenological discourse that it all relates to is, you know, really the dimension of race. And I don't know if it might be in important to just kind of look at, um, you know, the way that AI models pick up on a history of images circulating on the internet in which, um, you know, images of black people have always been kind of treated as like fungible in this in this way, like there's this conversation about digital blackface and so on that goes on. I think it was kind of present in some ways in the images that you were trying to, to allow us to inspect. Um, you know, and thinking about like, you know, what shared ownership of an image means uh, across kind of racial lines, like whether there are new questions that could come up by exploring this kind of project map through, you know, working with other, um, other artists, for example. But yeah, I wonder if people want to share any comment, kind of comments or insights on how they approach that question within their work. I think uh, a big inspiration for, at least for my work, was the news that, for example, I don't know what company, I think it was Levi's, a clothing company, global international company, uh, was starting, is going to start using, or maybe already started using AI generated models for their photography in order to be completely inclusive. So creating this kind of like um, complete combination of different attributes of race, body types, etc., to be comprehensively inclusive, but inclusive to the point that excludes the human. And <laughs> And for me, that was kind of like fascinating because when I was looking at these uh, videos on the stock, and it, it's quite breathtaking. There's thousands of these videos. It's just like what I selected to make the, these videos, not even like 10% of what I could find of political protests that most of them were staged to be in the United States, even, even though they're shot all around the world. And what was very interesting is that the, uh, the, the how rudimentary the process is and how like, non-algorithmic it is in a way, like it, it's, it's a different type of pulls that these creators have on the culture. And I would say that it's kind of like an, a spiritual pulls. Like you would go to these image banks and if you go to, for example, it, Adobe Stocks, the one that I happen to use, and I see these images of these protests, some of them are very well produced and quite believable within the framework of cinematic pieces. And you could click like, uh, a little button that's underneath the video that says either more from this series or more from these actors. And then you see all these actors that you're seeing in these images like very kind of like heavily embedded in the performance. But then the next one is this guy, I don't know, uh, one person being a flight attendant. Mm -hmm. You know, the same person that is like you see protesting like face to face to a police officer. Then it's a flight attendant in the next video. Then it's a concerned parent in a hospital in the next video. So I think, I think that it, it points out for me to uh, 
the interesting point in our culture, you know, like we are in a way kind of like becoming more specific in our identification as human beings, you know, like more present in our kind of like identifying markers, gender, pronouns, uh, 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 sexual orientations, race, and highly classified because of them, but at the same time, when we when we see each other reflected on these images and the images that we put out on the on, on the internet and, 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 and that we're that are kind of like uh, feeding on the databases that are the, out there for artists like us and in corporations to take advantage of, we are in a way also dissolving, right? Like we're just dissolving into like an ether of like thousands and thousands and thousands of like. Um, terabytes of data that are just flowing. So it's, that for me, that was the, 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 the tension that generated interest for me to make this work. You know, like that a company is able to, 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 to say something like, oh, there's this, so much interest in identity and representation that the obvious solution is to take the human out of it. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that, that contradiction is what, what was crucial for me to really talk about, or not really talk about identity because I really don't have much to say about it. I think I had many questions. About yeah, it. and I think it's important to note that the human isn't really out of it. Like, in this whole conversation, I was thinking about the example of the woman, young woman that made a video a few years back where she said her eyebrows were on fleek and it kind of spawned like this great internet moment, um, you know, became the subject of like, you know, Delta or someone did like an ad campaign like, our flights are on fleek, you know, it's getting everywhere. And, you know, this is just like a 15-year-old 15 15 -year girl, I think, not even a woman. Um, and, you know, she got zero dollars for it. So just thinking, like, you know, already there was this process of, like, images kind of being, like, taken and words being taken and then reused, often in ways that, like, are quite, dis you know, alienated from a creator's original kind of value and anything they might take from it. But now I think that becomes the subject of training sets. And I think, maybe I think what Matt was kind of alluding to is that in the, as these models of, you know, are developed, we'll be able to kind of put in the right prompt to get someone that looks like a lot like Juan or Michael or Carlos or Matt or any person in this room because our image is in there and can be found with the, can be kind of extracted in a sort of way with the right prompt and then be put into whatever scenario. And I think, you know, that plays, into, I think, the need for consent-based models, um, but also, like, a, you know, obviously the harm of that will be unevenly distributed uh, in the way that it has historically been, I think. Um, so... Or even, I don't know, in the case of Carlos, uh, a, 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 um, a, re, a kind of like a historical rerouting to really to the power of the mask, you know? Like, yeah. if, you're, if your image has already been mined in such an intense way, how can you trick the the um, the environment and how can you interface with the environment uh, through completely different ways of associating yourself with your body with it you know like and I'm talking specifically about even like shamanistic practices to like is uh, uh, folkloric practices like in Colombia there's there's a carnival of like it's called the carnival of black and whites where people switch races for a day. And, and, you know, like that within our, like, again, like the westernized internet logic, it just doesn't make sense. Like, why would you switch races for a day, you know, as, as, as a sign of, like, liberating yourself from a discourse that has been implanted by colonization, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, it's joyful and it's not part of, like, a... a um, like a harmful history. Exactly. So I, I, I also think that the power of the mask in a, in a time where, where our, our, we're being recorded all the time, it's, 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 inc it's incredibly, uh, uh, it's powerful, you know, like it's very, very intense. <clears throat> I mean, I asked, them, I asked to make a self-portrait mask and it came this strange face, <laughs> which in a strange way, it no, was mostly is... male and also mostly white. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing I, I wonder was because of me or, but, but I was not supposed to be there, you know, like I was just writing and asking. So there was no reason why the machine should know me. <clears throat> so then I realized it was just portraying itself. So these masks are from the machine, are, are, 
The self-portrait is made by the machine, not made by me. And I thought, well, this is interesting. To make it female, I had to, to specifically ask for it. Uh, but yeah, I guess, I mean, I also did them in a very initial moment. Mm -hmm. So maybe it also has developed a lot in the last year. So it, it felt like it was really, the beginning was still very clumsy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, I think there are important questions to make to the machine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think um, I, I wanted to make sure we got to the question of protests um, because we're in Paris 2023. People were saying, oh, oh, we have to, five? Oh, this is the last one. Is that okay? Or we have to, okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone before I came was like, oh, Paris, everything is it's falling to pieces over there, you know, but I think um, I haven't gotten to see any of that yet, um, especially in comparison to New York. The city's doing fantastically well. Um, but I do know that there is like an important protest movement happening at the moment. Um, and yeah, just what does it feel like to present this work in this city, in institution, against this backdrop of, um, of the conversations happening citywide in Paris today? Uh, well, I, I think there's n not a place in the world today where presenting a piece like this wouldn't resonate. Like if I presented in, in Bogota, in Colombia, where I'm from, like two weeks ago, and there were some protests there at the moment. I was reading something yesterday about how in the last 10 years, like the increase of like protests in the, in the world has been kind of like monumental, historical. Uh, and France has a huge story of protests. You know, there's been protests about the the, the, the raising of the, of the retiring age, like a couple of months ago, There's, uh, the, the yellow vests a couple of years ago. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I chose that specific set of images, because protest has become for me like the, a, a very defining characteristic of the last few years, at, at least in the Western world. Uh, but also what's very interesting to me uh, and what Carlos pointed out is that all these image makers from around the world that, that make up the, these stock banks are not from the United States but are very, very much in tune emotionally with the slogans and the performative aspects and the kind of like the choreography, so to say, or the, 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 perf the, yeah, the performative aspects of American-based protests. They're very much in tune with that. So it felt like a very interesting post-colonial move in which countries in which the United States has a very specific military presence or power, there's also people in those countries that are somehow um, um, appropriating the, the, or mining the content that social unrest brings from the United States, create content for it, and then kind of like sell it back in this kind of like weird post-colonial turn for me. Uh, so that's exactly what I chose that, that piece. And I think that piece, is, it's, 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 it, it resonates. And I think that's why it feels, again, I, I like that, that you use the word dangerous. Because when you see somebody in a um, clip like this with uh, uh, as, uh, like as a sign that is completely blank, that is made up exactly for post-production processes in which anybody could adhere any type of slogan, you realize that that emptiness presents some sort of like threat. You know, there's the threat of weaponizing this image. And, and, and in a way, I do weaponize the images to my own benefit in this piece, right? So I, I don't have a particular feeling because of France. I, I know France has a very historical kind of like precedent of protest and, 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 uh, and civil movements. But for me, it was more about that type of like kind of cultural imperialism of the United States and how because of the internet, because how broadcasted the, the, the social unrest in the United States has been worldwide how every time that now we see protests somewhere in the world because of images like this and images like the ones we see on Instagram and social media, we immediately try to translate any type of like local social unrest that probably has nothing to do with American-based uh, politics. We are able to somehow translate it into like an Americanized version of what locally could be something very, very different. And how these images kind of like in a way play along 
with that cultural imperialism, you know. So I was, yeah. I, that's why I, I was interested in them. Can I ask? Did you find images of horse charges, of policemen charging the crowd with a horse? A few, a few. I didn't use them. I was looking particularly at the images that were um, uh, people like looking at the camera, so I could animate them. But there were a few, but not many. But there's some amazing productions. There were some of some scenes that I found that had more than a hundred people in them. So I, I also wonder about that economy, you know, like mm -hmm. getting the actors, getting the props, just to shoot these images that are very specific to this one cause that is yeah. rooted in American-centric politics. I, I really think that's a powerful, uh, you know, kind of image, like the idea that, you know, your behavior in the protest can be weaponized be through the power of photography and now AI. And it made me think, like, maybe a last thought is just around, um, the work you've done, Matt, is sort of intentionally creating these different data sets. Like, can you imagine, um, or like, are there efforts underway to kind of create very intentional data sets that can be kind of community stewarded within different groups sort of worldwide? Like, we heard today from Nof, who was talking about how she couldn't find images that reflected her culture. You know, what kinds of efforts are you seeing happening or do you think should be happening around creating data sets that aren't, you know, aren't available for weaponization, at least not officially so, or, or could be stewarded within, within groups to create particular um, conversations? It's a good point. I mean, <clears throat> perhaps there's more work being done on this than I'm aware of, but I'm actually not aware of uh, a lot of work being done here, and I think a lot could be done. Um, to some of the points being raised earlier, right, there is this kind of question, um, do you have a right uh, to be whatever you want in a model context, or are you doomed uh, to be defined by the demographic classification a machine would attribute to you, right? Um, and so if you do want to see uh, you know, a greater representation for something uh, in this landscape, it, it only follows that you would need uh, to, gather, uh, to gather that data together. And I think in some cases, the, um, uh, you know, uh, there is an opportunity there. Um, it's one thing we looked at a little bit uh, without having done anything to kind of move the needle on this at all. Um, is that there's actually a, a great amount of potential, I think, for large groups of people uh, to come together under, let's say, a shared goal of, uh, uh, you know, uh, representing a particular uh, uh, period of art or a particular body of, of text or, you know, a particular history, um, and, and pull that data together <clears throat> in, in models or extensions that can uh, interact with models uh, to kind of expand the map of what a model may know about something. Um, and of course, the liberty that can be extended in that context too is these things don't also have to be uh, uh, strictly factual, which is, is on, on the subject of protest, I really think that that's kind of an interesting thing too, right? Like, uh, do you have the right in these, in these models when you are able to be prompted or, or invoked in certain cases? Do you have the right to, uh, you know, have your, uh, uh, your representation uh, be different, be divorced from your, your, your passport or, you know, uh, uh, certain attributes that you know you didn't choose, um, uh, but but I think there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of work that, that can be done there, and it almost necessitates uh, collective action just by dint of the amount of data that's necessary. Um, yeah. You know, uh, and so this is one thing we've looked at a lot for things like uh, data compensation. You know, there's this kind of wicked challenge where it turns out uh, compensation models when you're talking about like uh, text to image things. Uh, the compensation regime is actually very, very difficult um, because of the amount of data involved. You know, if you were to compensate each individual there, you'd, you'd be talking about fractions of pennies. Um, um, uh, and so you kind of really have to start thinking about collective credit, uh, accreditation and compensation models to move the needle on this issue at all, right? Yeah. Uh, where you say, okay, well, what, if, what would it mean if, you know, uh, a group of people from a certain jurisdiction were all uh, to come together uh, determine what would happen with a particular data set that they all compiled, um, and then maybe vote on uh, on what proceeds from that model would go toward. Uh, and and the economics of that push you toward thinking about collective structures or collective accomplishments, because as I said, the check to each individual might be five bucks, but if there's you know fifty thousand people there, that could build a school, you know. Um, and so it, it's this interesting it's this interesting uh, 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 dynamic that I think we'll see more of, and I'd love to hear uh, of any projects in that direction if I'm missing anything. Yeah, I mean, I think that right now we're in this very centralized moment of AI, and that's 
beginning to fracture and is fracturing and we're moving into a different direction for the next chapter in which I think community stewarded data sets can play a big role. Um, so I think that's a nice place to leave this panel and move into our keynote for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> Thank you very much to the three of you, and uh, now we're welcoming Eric Baudelaire for the keynote and concluding, conclusive sorry, talk of today. Since the Pompidou will actually, talking about protest, we'll have to close a bit earlier than usual today, so yeah, we, but it's, we, have, we have to finish by uh, nine, so it's fine. <laughs> Okay, hello. Um, so let me see how this works. Okay. So um, thank you for being here and thank you for this wonderful day of talks and presentations. Um, so this is a keynote presentation, and um, what makes a good keynote? A good keynote captivates the audience with a compelling narrative, delivers insightful and thought-provoking ideas, there we go, and inspires action or change. That's quite a program, so let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, art, a tapestry of human expression, has transcended time, cultures, and boundaries. Now, imagine the possibilities when we introduce the transformative power of artificial intelligence into this creative realm. AI, with its ability to analyze vast amounts of data and generate novel ideas, becomes a wellspring of inspiration, a collaborator pushing the boundaries of artistic exploration. Yet, let us remember that while AI can assist in the artistic process, the essence of art lies within us, the artists. The human perspective, emotions, and experiences give art its soul, and AI serves as a complementary tool, enriching our creative endeavors rather than replacing our unique vision. Together, we embrace the convergence of art and AI, forging a path where innovation and imagination intertwine. Blah, 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 blah. And at this point, I press the stop generating button on ChatGPT, and I wrote, um, ChatGPT, your speech is quite boring. Um, it's quite conventional. Can you please rewrite it with a situationist inflection? And this is what we get. Comrades, prepare yourselves for a subversive journey into the heart of artistic rebellion as we delve into the enigma of art and the audacious alliance between AI and creative expression. Art, once a weapon of cultural subversion, has fallen prey to the clutches of commodification and the spectacle. But fear not, for we now wield the disruptive power of artificial intelligence. AI, with its calculated algorithms, becomes our accomplice in unraveling the established norms. It seduces us with its capacity to generate novel ideas, craft um, visuals, and even birth autonomous creations. Yep, here we go. Yet, let us not be swayed by this seduction. AI remains a mere tool, a mechanized puppet in our hands. The true essence of art lies in our subjective experiences, our emotional depths, and our fearless exploration of the human condition. Together, we channel the spirit of the situationist movement, navigating this uncharted territory, dismantling the oppressive structures of the art establishment, and reclaiming art as a weapon of cultural liberation and catalysts for societal transformation. Embrace the chaos, comrades. Embrace the revolution. So that's a little better, perhaps a bit dramatic, but uh, ChatGPT, are you sure Guy Debord would address his audience as comrades? Aren't you conflating situationists and communists? 
to which GPT answers, you're right, my apologies for the misstep. A more fitting opening for a situationist inflected speech would be, dear friends, please accept my apologies for any confusion cause. Apology accepted. So one of the things I do find interesting about these large language models is that conversation as an interface feels very different than writing search queries. It's more fluid, um, it's less binary. You can coax the model, you can contradict it, um, put it on a different track and receive different responses. So let's look into GPT's idea that um, together, the uh, artificial intelligence and us can generate weapons of cultural liberation and catalysts for societal transformation. So first of all, let's examine this tool that will help us achieve cultural liberation through situationist art. What is it actually made of? And on this topic, um, I think Naomi Klein in a piece she wrote for The Guardian is, is quite um, precise. She reminds us that behind these large language models, there is the largest and most consequential theft in human history. Because we are witnessing um, the wealthiest companies in the world unilaterally seizing the sum total of human knowledge that exists in digital scrapable form and walling it off inside proprietary products, many of which will take direct aim at the humans whose lifetime of labor trained the machines without giving permission or consent. So uh, why, for instance, should a for-profit company be permitted to feed the paintings, drawings, and photographs of living artists into a program so that it can be used to generate doppelganger images of those very artists' work with the benefits flowing to everyone but the artists themselves? So what is to be done? We can sign up to opt out with the tools provided by Matthew, uh, which we just spoke about. Um, and as Joseph pointed out earlier today, the painter and illustrator Molly Crabapple is also helping lead a movement of artists um, challenging this um, industry in, in, in courts. And she wrote a letter, which we can all sign, where she writes that this is effectively the greatest art heist in history. This is what the greatest art heist in history looks like. Um, or here's another version. And this is kind of great because, I mean, the way I read this image is that the greatest art heist in history is the theft of the uh, Parthenon frieze. Um, so I guess we can send that to the British Museum. So um, I guess if this was a keynote presentation given in a context of a lawyer's convention or a law school, we could get together and imagine a strategy to sue or to sort of fight um, massive copyright infringements behind these AI models. Um, but Naomi Klein in the same piece reminds us that we've sort of been here before. Silicon Valley routine, routinely calls um, theft disruption and usually gets away with it. And the strategy is always pretty much the same. You charge ahead into lawless territory, claim the old rules don't apply to our new technology, you scream that regulation will only help China. And all the while, you get your facts solidly on the ground. And by the time we all get over the novelty of these toys and start taking stock of the social, political, and economic wreckage, the tech is already so ubiquitous that the courts and the policymakers just throw up their hands. So it's very difficult to fight big tech. And if it's not going to work, then the second option is to learn to live with it and uh, perhaps even embrace it. And so let's start by trying to understand how AI understands art. So ChatGPT, let's see if we can agree on what art is and establish some kind of shared geography. And I'll start by contributing two quotes. The first is from Jean-Luc Godard from his film Je vous salue Sarajevo. In 1993, Godard says, la règle c'est la culture, l'exception c'est l'art. So culture is the rule, the exception is art. A second definition that I will contribute to ChatGPT comes from uh, Robert Filiou, Robert Filiou. Um, I like his trajectory as a, as, a, as a person and as well as, as, as an artist. He took part in the French resistance in 1943 
And after the war, he moved to the US where he worked for the most American corporation possible. He worked for the Coca-Cola company. And then in the 50s, he um, worked for the UN in South Korea, figuring out, a, a, developing a plan for reconstruction as an economist. And eventually, he became a poet and an artist. And I have no idea how these images were generated. And I really looked into it, but I couldn't find any possible connection to Robert Fidu. Anyway, Robert Fidu did say, art is what makes life more interesting than art. Or, wart your Bart. That's um, so Fidu's quote, art is what makes life more interesting than art. This is ChatGPT's interpretation of this sentence. Uh, art is what makes life more interesting than art implies that art's true essence lies not in the physical manifestations, but in the experiences, emotions, and connections it generates. Art has the power to transcend the boundaries of traditional artistic mediums and infiltrate everyday life, infusing it with curiosity, wonder, and meaning. So I think we agree, chat GPT. But can AI make art more interesting than AI? And chat GPT replies, while AI can assist in the creative process and generate compelling outputs, it lacks the lived experiences, emotions, and consciousness that imbue art with its captivating qualities. OK, thank you, chat GPT. So now, your turn, can you share some quotes from female artists, preferably, about the nature of art? And ChatGPT generates the following. Number one, art is not a handicraft. It is the transmission of feeling the artist has experienced. Leo Tolstoy, as quoted by Ellen Key. Number two, art is the highest form of hope. Gerhard Richter, as quoted by Marina Abramovic. Three, Art is the lie that enables us to realize the truth. Pablo Picasso, as quoted by Anais Nin. So if you're starting to recognize a pattern, I'm hoping. Four, the artist's job is to be a witness to his time in history. Robert Rauschenberg, as quoted by Yoko Ono. So Chad GPT, you are either hopelessly biased or just completely inept. Uh, please give me a quote by a woman speaking for herself, not citing a man. And so G Chad GPT worked a little bit harder, and in position number five, we get Art is the Only Way to Run Away Without Leaving Home by Twyla Tharp. This is good. This helps because we do know post COVID that we will be spending a lot of time at home and we will need to find ways to escape. Second quote. Art is not what you create, it's how you create it. Yoko Ono, speaking for herself. So this begs the question, if it was created by algorithms, ChatGPT, is it really art? And ChatGPT answers, intention, creativity, and emotional resonance can still be present in algorithmically generated art, even if the process differs from conventional human-driven methods. Okay. Lastly, Frida Kahlo, art is the reflection of the artist's soul. And I was tempted, but I did not ask ChatGPT whether AI has a soul, because I'm pretty sure the answer would have been drafted by the legal department and not by the neural network itself. So not as interesting. Anyway, enough with the theory. Um, practically speaking, what kind of art does AI make um, one thing it makes very well is uh, fake photographs, highly memeable images of the Pope in a Balenciaga puff jacket driving on a Harley, piloting a jet plane. I don't think there's anything fundamentally sh sort of paradigm shifting about um, these kinds of images. I mean, Photoshop's been around for a while, and, and to some degree, this is just sort of a driverless version of Photoshop. It runs without anybody's hand on the mouse, but it doesn't really kind of dramatically shift something um, into something really new. Um, I think I'm more interested in how AI deals with things that it does not know, and I think we've seen a lot of examples of this today. In other words, when you enter this space um, where the AI just doesn't have the reference images in the training set. Um, so it guesses and it speculates. And um, 
I think in general, speculative images tend to be more captivating. So for example, recently, just in my own work, I've been interested in telekinesis um, and certain studies in the 1970s and a specific little robot, which is called a, a ticoscope, uh, which was used in parapsychology experiments in a laboratory in Paris where my mother worked. And as a kid, I participated in some of these experiments in the 1980s, and I do have memories, but there's really barely any photographic documentation, and certainly none of it is in the models. So I can ask ChatGPT to um, generate, or sorry, Dali in this case, to generate an image of a ticoscope on a round table, tracing a Brownian pattern in a Paris office in 1979. This is another, another stab at the same request. Um, so ticoscope, tico means chance in Greek, obviously, and ticoscope is a machine that sees chance. So here's a machine that sees chance, or another one. And so I, I think I'm, you know, interested in this sort of data quality uh, in the mechanism that generates a collage from the internet's image subconsciousness, especially, especially in areas that remain shrouded in mystery or that are not well documented or that escape consensus. Um, so another subject I've been working on for a number of years now is, for example, a, a complete picture of the assassination of Aldo Moro in Rome in 1978. And these images to me feel like, um, it's not so much a driverless Photoshop for me, it's more like a, like a core sample of available iconography from, in this case, from the Italian years of lead, uh, but some kind of sort of like collages of, of, of a period of history and it's sort of aggregating this in together. And I think there's something that is actually quite fair, quite, quite accurate about them, about a mood, about a time, about a period. So while I'm not necessarily very interested in the deep fake per se, I am interested in the question of the fake when it overlaps with the realm of the absent images, an area of falsification that seeks to fill the void left by the absence of image representation. So I'm thinking about the way people like filmmakers, um, film, filmmakers like Peter Watkins fabricated fake images of a nuclear exchange between the Soviet Union and Great Britain in his 1967 film, The War Game, because at the time, um, and, at the, and it was already a very effective way of sort of working to such an extent that the BBC banned the film um, simply because of the tremendous political charge of the, of the contained in these false images. And in this sense, I think the, the fake image can become a militant image or it can become in, sort of infused with this power uh, of filling a void. And since there were no images of what happened in Hiroshima at ground zero at the very moment where 66,000 people lost their lives, Watkins wanted us wanted to take us to this place of horror and, um, and by essentially making a fake, a very powerful fake. So I sort of queried uh, Dali to try to see what would happen if, for example, you try to generate a specific image of a Russian soldier, or Russian soldiers killing a civilian in Bucha, Ukraine in, in 2022. And it, it sort of it, it remains a very elusive image, or a specific image of um, a migrant dying far from sight on the high seas. Um, and uh, of course, when you start thinking about sort of these absent images, um, come to mind, you know, the, the four fragmentary images taken by members of the Sonderkommandos in Auschwitz in 1944, with which uh, Georges Didier Berman uh, wrote about in his seminal book called uh, Image Malgré Tout, Images Despite Everything. And you know, the, this historic particularity that the Nazis did all they could to ensure that there would be no images of Auschwitz. Uh, 
the Holocaust, while it occurred, took place outside, completely outside the realm of images. And, and, um, and for those who follow the thinking of Claude Lanzmann, since there are no images that tell the entirety of the Holocaust, there can be no images. And certainly the people who write the guidelines for some of these um, image generators are sort of Lanzmannian in their um, methodology. So perhaps because of the nature of my work, I tend to be interested in this area where the image is put in crisis, and in particular in its indexical relationship to the real. And of course, this question is particularly significant when we enter the realm of human suffering. And this has been a central theme in art history. Uh, Francisco Goya's series of gravures, the disasters of war, the disasters of war are you know, a very important turning point in the history of moral feelings and sorrow. Uh, his images of war are fashioned as a literal assault on the sensibility of the viewer. The artist shouting at the top of his lungs, war is hell, it needs to end. And from very early on, from the, I mean, very quickly after the invention of photography, or at least um, as soon as the photographic camera was mobile enough to be transported, it was brought very quickly to the battlefields, first in Crimea, then to the killing fields of the American Civil War. And uh, one of the early photographers of these um, killing fields, Alexander Gardner, uh, photographing dead soldiers at the Battle of Gettysburg, um, captioned a photograph titled, A Harvest of Death, with this sort of sentence, which could have been written by Goya, here are the dreadful details. Let them aid in preventing such another calamity falling upon the nation. So really, from the birth of photography, there is this sort of tradition that comes directly from Goya um, of making images with the hope of stopping humans from committing uh, massacres. And as time goes by, more images are creating, and the massacres continue to happen. Uh, so the photographs denouncing the horrors of war were orchestrated at the time. Um, if you look at these pictures of, of Crimea or the Battle of Gettysburg, you know, we know today that the bodies were physically moved across the battlefield, that new weapons were placed, uh, cannonballs were set on the roads. In other words, early photographers came from painting, and the idea of staging the real was very natural. So the, the point was to bring the war home. There was no, you know, later in the 20th century, there was an ethics of photography as truth, um, but this didn't exist initially. Uh, and as this sort of ethics of photography as truth emerged, towards the middle of the 20th century, it also quickly got very murky, and the veracity of the most iconic war images has always been questioned. Debates ensued about whether certain images were true, whether they were staged, whether they were faked. And alongside um, the issue or the question of veracity, another other series of questions emerged in the 70s. And I think Susan Sontag's seminal book on photography from 1977 is, off, is obviously, I think, an important text. And she makes the case that the proliferation of photographic images of war and violence ends up establishing within people a chronic voyeuristic relationship to the world. And so the paradox for Sontag is that the consequences of this overproduction and mass circulation of images of violence is that the meaning of all events is leveled and eventually made equal, and the political effect is dulled and possibly voided. So in regards to this sort of broad history of the image, my feeling is that the, the advent or the arrival of AI today and of synthetic deep fakes, it doesn't really propel us into the future. I would make the case that in fact, or at least in an epistemological sense, it takes us to the past. And to be precise, it takes us 196 years in the past, just prior to Nicephor Niepce and the very, very first photographic image. So perhaps AI simply bringing us back to a time in art history when there were no codes of, or ethics of veracity, when every image of human suffering was a creation, when nobody ever wondered whether Goya's gravures were true to reality. And so I just want to think for, for a brief moment about what this implies. So of course, 
you know, there's a million of very practical concerns, right? Each one is scarier than the next. Uh, you know, in France right now, I think in, in the United States uh, constantly, um, we are, I think, very preoccupied by this reality that is that we live in a world where police officers routinely, routinely murder people, people of color for the most part. And if no images are recorded, these murders just didn't happen. And it's, it's only a matter of time, I think, if we think about the present moment before the right-wing media starts telling us that the images that are recorded, when they are recorded, of these killings are actually not real. They are deep fakes. They're fake news. And then you can imagine a world where the policemen's lawyers are going to make a similar case in court, and then these killings will continue in perfect immunity. I mean, we have to remember that in France, where in the weeks and months after George Floyd was killed, the current government in France uh, was this close from succeeding to pass a law that would have effectively made it illegal to film the police. In other words, if you took out a camera while the police were killing somebody, you would be arrested and your phone would be confiscated and you would be fined. So it's really not that much of a stretch to imagine that the state will use to their advantage this idea that images can be put in question. Um, and now I'm going to make sort of a, a, a stretch, but bear with me. But in a convoluted way, it also feels like we've kind of been here before, uh, a few years ago. In 1992, in his essay, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, Jean Baudrillard draw, draws on his concepts of simulation and the hyperreal to argue that the Gulf War did not take place, but was a carefully scripted media event. It was a, it was a virtual war. And 20 years after the publication of that book, uh, simultaneously with the second American invasion of Iraq, Karl Rove essentially made a very similar point, or a very similar argument in a interview that he gave uh, to a New York Times reporter. And so I'll, I'll quote the interview from the New York Times. So Karl Rove said to the reporter, speaking to the reporter, you live in what we call the reality-based community, which Rove defines as people who, quote, believe that solutions emerge from a judicious study of discernible reality. And so the journalist nods and murmurs something about enlightenment principles and empiricism and Rove cuts him off. He says, that's not the way the world really works anymore. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And so to me, there's something kind of spooky when thinkers on the left and on the right agree about the collapse of reality. Um, Erica Balsam published a very beautiful piece about this very question, which is where I found this quote about um, Karl Rove. Uh, the piece is called The Reality-Based Community, and in it she writes, have you heard that reality has collapsed? Post-truth politics, the death of facts, fake news, paranoia on the rise, such pronouncement are often feverish objections to a nightmarish condition. Yet inside the echo chamber of 21st century communication, their anxiety-ridden recirculation can exacerbate the very conditions they attempt to describe and decry. In asserting the indiscernibility of fact and fiction, the panicked statement that reality has collapsed at times accomplishes little but furthering the collapse of reality. Proclaiming the unreality of the present lifts the heavy burdens of gravity, belief, and action, affecting a great leveling whereby all statements float by cloaked in doubt. And I, for one, care about what Erica describes as the heavy burdens of gravity, belief, and action. Um, in 2003, Susan Sontag wrote another seminal essay, and I have to say I have great admiration for writers who sort of revisit their classics 30 or 40 years later and sort of correct themselves or change their minds. And in the very beautiful text, one of the last she published, called Regarding the Pain of Others, uh, Sontag takes a new, well, she proposes a new take on the relationship between pictures and outrage. She tells us, quote, 
To designate a hell is not, of course, to tell us anything about how to extract people from that hell, how to moderate hell's flames. Sontag tells us that if pictures of atrocity are meant to rekindle the memory of what humans are capable of committing, in fact, quote, too much value is assigned to memory, not enough to thinking. And a little later in the book, she writes, quote, there's nothing wrong with standing back and thinking. To paraphrase several sages, nobody can think and hit someone at the same time. So in the age of AI, more so than ever before, if the value of images as testimony diminishes, the necessity for images that make us think is more critical than ever. And so this is the moment in the keynote address when we sort of steer the talk towards something inspiring and optimistic. And for this, I turn to Samuel Beckett to help us find a way out of this AI mess. And Beckett tells us, quote, to find a form to ac that accommodates the mess, that is the task of the artist now, to find a form that accommodates the mess. So let's think about what Beckett means. He said this in an interview in 1961. He is talking about the mess of modern life, this buzzing confusion, he calls it. And he says, quote, the confusion is not my invention. We cannot listen to a conversation for five minutes without being acutely aware of the confusion. It is all around us, and our only chance now is to let it in. The only chance of renovation is to open our eyes and see the mess. It is not a mess you can make sense of. And I can't think of a better way to characterize the world we live in today, 62 years after Beckett said this. And Beckett does not say that the role of the artist is to represent the mess. He does not say our role is to describe the mess or provide a true and real description of it or even to understand or to change or to fight or to improve the mess. He says we need to find a form to accommodate the mess, to accommodate. So that's a word I looked up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and uh, this is what I get. To provide with something desired, needed, or suited. To make room for. To hold without crowding or inconvenience to bring into agreement or concord, to reconcile, to give consideration to, to allow for, to make fit, suitable, or congruous. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, comrades, I think we can do something with these words from Beckett. There is a chance of renovation, but we need to open our eyes to see the mess. It is not a mess we can make sense of. It is all around us, and our only chance now is to let it in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Eric. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to all of you who came to attend this marathon today. And uh, thank you to Catist. A big thank you to the technical team who's been amazing. Merci à la régie. Un grand merci. And thank you to the artists. Mm -hmm.